Welcome to Bet the Edge. I'm Jay Croucher here with Drew Dinsick. As always, today we're going to talk about NFL Defensive Player of the Year market. Uh, we will talk week two of preseason in the NFL, and then we'll close out with a little look at the Premier League and the outright market there, with the Premier League kicking off on Friday. But how are you, Drew? What's the news, man? Oh, man. Just uh, doing my best to absorb the fire hose of information uh, in the NFL space as we are clearly into week two here of uh, preseason football and uh, a lot happening. Um, really just feeling for Vikings fans. <laughs> seems like they can't catch a break right now. Um, but uh, yeah, no, this is a, this is a fun time of year as you know, I'm getting back into tennis a bit just so that I'm ready to bet the U S open and close the book on tennis for the year. Uh, and then uh, kind of fine tuning my numbers. And I've made more adjustments this year from original number making to where I stand today than I usually do. Um, and I feel like that's kind of indicative of there's just like there's a lot of moving parts this year with new quarterbacks, new schemes, new systems uh, and specific, you know, units that are going to matter good and bad that need to be upgraded and downgraded. So um, fired up to to really see some football that matters. Yep. All right. Well, let's get into the football. Let's talk uh, DPOY, um, your favorites, as they mm-hmm. tend to be every year. Uh, Micah Parsons is plus 550. He will presumably win this award one day. Uh, TJ Watt, also in the plus 550 range, um, who has won in the past and then came second last year. Uh, I will go to my grave thinking that if TJ Watt didn't get hurt in the third quarter against the Ravens in week 18 and had mm-hmm. got, I think he needed one more sack to get 20, I think that would have been the tipping point at which he beat Garrett. But, um, uh, well, fortunately for, for me, uh, selfishly, he <laughs> didn't get that 20th sack. Um, Nick Bosa, uh, who won two years ago, he is seven to one. Max Crosby, also seven to one, and then Miles Garrett. Um, not a lot of respect for the reigning defensive player of the year to be the fifth favorite at plus eight hundred, and then longer shots: Aiden Hutchinson ten to one, Will Anderson twenty to one, uh, and then we can talk about some guys further down the board. Um, but what do you? Th- what's your initial impression of how this market is priced? So uh, the rubric for defensive player of the year is in some ways related to what you produce in a given year. It's in some way way related to the perception of you being on the best defense in the NFL. Um, But it comes with a little bit of a caveat, which is that it's tough to break through and get recognition and get awards if you aren't already entrenched in the mind of the voting block as as a guy that is among the best defensive players in the year already. And I think that you can kind of go back through the years and look at the voting pretty carefully. And and in general, when it's a close call, they tend to defer to the guys with, that are known quantities. The Aaron Donalds of the world, the you know the the Garretts last year, the TJ Watts, like like those guys are always going to carry a premium in this market because of the name brand, um, you know, that they bring to the table. And I think ultimately, you know, there are some questions to ask about whether a lot of these defenses at the top, you know, in, you know with elite guys at the top of the board if they're gonna live up to expectations to warrant this kind of pricing consideration and um i know you're feeling you know you're feeling frisky about michael parsons being the guy and this being his year but i gotta be honest with you man like not loving any of the buzz that i'm hearing out of dallas camp uh i don't think that their defense is going to take a meaningful step back but that unit looks thin um i've kind of noticed just generally handicapping the cowboys year in year out that Parsons tends to wear down a bit as we get into the later months of the season because he's utilized and he just leaves it all on the field on every play. Um, and now we're getting reports that, you know, they're considering utilizing him in red zone packages. And it's like, okay, this is a thin unit. He's a guy that wears down and it seems almost like they're inclined to make it happen more aggressively. And uh, all of that makes me pretty nervous that, um, you know, he's going to have his best performances at the time of the year. It really matters for ultimately clinching this award. So um, I would go to you know I would go to bat if you were telling me that hey we're redrafting non quarterbacks um I would tell you that Mike Parsons needs to be at the top of that list uh with some of the elite wide receivers um and he would be the first first defensive player taken in a redraft but uh I do worry a bit about his role in this system how much he's going to be playing in coverage um you know the degree to which uh uh, Zimmer is going to utilize him to help, uh, you know, patch some of the other holes and maybe take away from some of his show-stopping, game-changing plays uh, to where he should be still the co-favorite. Um, I can say a lot of positive things about Pittsburgh, <laughs> not on the offense, all on the defense. Um, but TJ Watt spooks me a bit, uh, considering that the end of that schedule looks absolutely brutal for 
uh, the Steelers in terms of accumulating, uh, you know, sacks in terms of accumulating awards in terms of getting wins. Uh, it might be a very, very red uh, month of November, December for the Steelers, at which case that's going to poison the pot for him a bit. Uh, Nick Bosa and the Niners defense to me look like they're going to take a step backwards. Max Crosby is amazing. Maybe, maybe the best pure pass rusher of any of these guys we're talking about, but the Raiders offensive side of the ball scares me to the point where, are you going to have a lot of third and fourth quarter opportunities where pass rush is going to matter? Uh, or is the assignment going to be more stop the run so we get a chance to come back? Uh, and so for those reasons, I can see some doubt for Crosby. And, you know, that leaves me to going back to the well with Garrett. That this Browns defense is just as good as they were last year, maybe better. They've basically brought back a fully healthy and fully dynamic unit. Uh, you have outstanding coverage led by Denzel Ward, incredible linebacker play led by JOK, who they just resigned, and uh, it's a deep D line with uh, you know continuity here at the court at the uh, coordinator position. Um, and I think if you were to tell me that you know of these teams that we've mentioned so far, which do you have the highest confidence as a top two defense at the end of the season? It's the Browns. So um, if you were going to make me take a price of these guys in the top tier right now, I think it's Garrett for me at eight to one. Yeah, I think the thing with this award, one, it's become a defensive lineman award. D lineman have won nine of the past 10 years. The one exception was Stefan Gilmore when that Patriots defense in, I want to say 2019, was just it was just outlier good. It was the clear best defense in the NFL, and he had six picks, I think an inception return touchdown, and it's just that defense became the story of the season. So if you want to make a case for a long shot in that regard, I think like Sauce Gardner would be the clear guy where the Jets have number one defense upside and um, Sauce in the 60 to 1 range. I'd probably rather just see the season unfold a little bit and particularly see if they lose to San Francisco in week one um, yeah. before jumping on Sauce. But he would be the long shot in the mold of Gilmore. But otherwise, it is a D lineman award. I think the thing and the reason why I skew to Parsons and Garrett every year is. I think this has weirdly become, you know, we always talk about and kind of make fun of the idea that, you know, these awards, they don't arrive at the right choice and they're not based on merit and they're based on all these um, extremely subjective factors. And that's right why, like, you know, it's kind of ludicrous that Jalen Williams doesn't factor into most improved player at all, even though he's the most deserving candidate um, in our eyes. But with Defensive Player of the Year in the NFL, I think that with – just the wealth of statistics and information that are out there mm -hmm. now about pass, what, pass rush win rate, about double team rate, PFF pass rush grade, like all of this stuff. I think that this has become a somewhat efficient award in terms of mm -hmm. arriving at the right choice. And that's why I just think that Garrett and Parsons are the two best players. I think they're yeah. in their own tier in front of everyone else. The thing too, if you're betting on Parsons, what I liked is that last year, Last year, it seemed like he scaled back on the run defense, and he was just sure. like, "I'm yeah. just getting, I'm getting my, yeah. I'm getting my, uh, my pressures. I'm trying to get my sacks." And if you're betting on him for Defensive Player of the Year, that's exactly what you want because no one's going to lose this award because they have a bad PFF run defense grade, which is like, you know, the I guess like if you look at like a team rush defense, maybe that hurts him around the edges, but for the most part, like I don't think many people are changing their uh, Defensive Player of the Year votes because. Um, Micah Parsons has like a bad PFF run defense grade. Um, so I think that the key factors are uh, one, just, you know, actual kind of meritorious performance and how good that you play as, as an edge rusher and the pressures and the pass rush win rate and stuff, all that where Parsons and Garrett, I think are your two most likely guys to me, the most deserving. And then you have mm -hmm. team defensive rating, um, is a, another really important factor. And that's why Garrett ultimately won because the Browns were the number one defense and that made up for the fact that he finished seventh in sacks. So you add all of that up and I think that the way I would order it, I would still have Parsons as the favorite just okay. because I think that the Cowboys, I think they are a high variance defense where um, if they all stay healthy, I think it's going to be an excellent defense. Um, it's just that they're very like the whole team is just top heavy. Where if Demarcus Lawrence or Trayvon Diggs, um, even like Deron Bland, who's a divisive figure, but I think overall is a, a good CB2. Um, if those guys stay healthy, like it's just it's going to be a good defense. There's a lot of talent there. Um, and Parsons, there's just there's just zero concern whatsoever that Micah Parsons will be the most deserving winner and not win the award, um, because he's Micah Parsons and on the Cowboys, true. Um, 
But Garrett, who right now, Garrett being the fifth favorite is just ludicrous. Like Garrett should be a top two favorite. And the way I would attack this market, I would back Parsons in the six to one range and Garrett in the eight to one range and basically say I'm riding with Parsons and Garrett, in my opinion, the two best players at plus 300 that one of those two wins the award. Um, Of this second, well, you could say second tier of guys in terms of, I think, talent and projected output, but with what Bosa, Crosby, and I'll throw Hutchinson in there. Is there one of those four that is most appealing to your price? Mm. Um, I was very much flirting with Hutch- Hutchinson was going to be my guy because he was pressure leader last year. And if he basically regresses to his pressure to sack ratio from his rookie year uh, and he creates that many pressures, he's like flirting with the all time sack record. <laughs> but uh, I kind of have cooled off of in general expecting him to have as effective a season from a pass rushing standpoint. Um, and I just didn't general kind of look at uh the the price margin between him and a guy like garrett who is the best you know in that conversation just like you laid out uh is enough for me to kind of cool my jets a little bit uh the uh the other kind of the other guy i want to mention for this conversation because his he's been bet into this range um you know so price is gone although i'm seeing some 25 to ones about is daniel hunter um i don't know that he has the name brand recognition to be considered the best defensive player um, but certainly what, uh, you know, what they put together from a pass rush standpoint in Houston is formidable. And this was a Demeco Ryan's led defense that really does help the stars accumulate counting stats and Hunter to me, at least looks the better of the, um, you know, of him and Will Anderson in terms of the guy benefiting from that. Um, he had a couple of absolute blow up plays in their preseason game. And I know we're not really leaning into preseason telling us much, but if you're already being utilized and doing your job to that degree in the preseason, then I, I'm excited to see what you bring in the regular season. But, um, you know, the, the, I think the ace in the hole, uh, you know, and, and again, like Hunter, if you can find 25 to one, I'm intrigued. Uh, he's been bet into like the 10 to one rate place, the you know, range at places, um, which is getting a little aggressive. Uh, but, uh, he could be the guy if Houston leaps into sort of top three defense conversation. Um, but, uh, yeah, really the ace in the hole for Garrett, in my opinion, is, uh, <laughs> he gets to play the uh, Steelers twice at the end of the season. <laughs> and, uh, the Steelers quarterbacks, they look like sack eaters, uh, and the Steelers offensive line to me has some huge question marks. So um, just in general, the sequencing helping Garrett at the right time of year, assuming he's healthy, uh, could be enough to push him into the into the lead at that time. Yeah, and I think the schedule stuff is, I mean, it's marginal because you never, it's difficult to project what a team is going to look like by the end of the season, but it does matter in that if you're just playing over and over again, quarterbacks who don't get sacked, uh, that's a problem. Whereas I feel like I've been against TJ Watt in this market, like every year of his professional career. And it was just infuriating the fact that he gets to play Lamar Jackson or Tyler Huntley twice a year. And yeah, Lamar's awesome, but Lamar takes a ton of sacks. Joe Burrow takes a ton of sacks. Whoever has been quarterback in Cleveland, it feels like for 20 years, takes a ton of sacks. And the yeah. fact that Watt would get to go up against those guys um, was a huge help. And um, last year I had, like I think, basically no Parsons. And what gave me confidence down the end is that uh, his, his three of his last four games were against Josh Allen, Tua Tagovailoa, and Jared Goff, guys who don't get sacked. Um, and that was a big part, whereas Garrett... Um, had a much more favorable schedule and was going up in you know in his big game in week 17 he was going up against um the jets who i think that was the trevor simeon show um by that point so um that does that does matter um you would say that i guess with garrett and watt playing in the afc north and going up against quarterbacks who do take sacks maybe that helps a bit Parsons as well gets to go up against Daniel Jones. Parsons gets two games against Jaden Daniels um, mm-hmm. as well, who I think is going to get sacked quite a bit. That's a good point. Um, which I think will help him. Uh, these other guys like Bosa, I'm with you. I just don't think the Niners defense is going to be good enough. And that combined with the fact that I don't think he's quite at the level of Parsons or Garrett, even though he's incredible. And I think I probably have him third. I think Watt, Bosa and Crosby, I think that's, you know, that's pretty close um, for third. And then guys like Daniel Hunter, 
Um, and I kind of get sucked into this each year with looking at the prices for two years ago, the guy was Matthew Judon, who was like leading the league in sacks after 12 weeks or something like Matthew Judon went defensive player of the year. If he is the sack leader and last year it was, uh, Josh Allen and Trey Hendrickson who had these massive sack totals and what I've arrived at for guys like that guys who I think are pretty squarely in terms of pedigree and how voters conceive of them as you know very much your tier two um, or if you're delineating it with more specificity your tier three I think the way that those guys have to win is they need to be like the sack leader by like minimum three sacks or they need to be on the number one defense because they're just not going to win a fight otherwise against, you know, what Parsons, Garrett, yeah. Um, yeah. Nick Bosa. So that's the way I would approach um, those type of players. And I'd probably throw Daniel Hunter um, into there. Is there any long shot in this market that you like? I tried to make a formidable case for the real long shots, but I think what you're saying is 100% the reality, which is if you're in tier three and you are an excellent pass rusher or an excellent defensive player you still need something pretty outrageous to happen to get this home um and like so for instance like you're almost better off just betting to neil hunter to be the sack leader yeah at price <laughs> right like they, he could lead sacks and they could still give it to character parsons that's very very realistic um so yeah there's there's nobody with uh, any price longer than about 25 to 1 that i think has a realistic shot uh, and we'll see if we end up beating those words but uh yeah at the bottom of the board to me looks like dead deadpool to me, it is very instructive, and this is something I try and do every year. Is um, even though there's a temptation once the season's over, once the awards have been announced, to just like move on to the next thing and start mm -hmm. um, blasting Rudy Gobert, Defensive Player of the Year, or whatever. But it's important <laughs> to actually where you can read voters' rationales and why they um, voted the way that they did. Um, and Peter King, who you know, I think puts a lot of thought into his votes and provides a lot of detail as to why he voted the way he did. I thought it was instructive that he said, and he was leaning what at one point, I think, and I think he ended up voting Garrett and his rationale was, it was just Miles Garrett's year. Like he was the guy who I will remember the most from the season. And that just, what that means, I think really, is that the Browns had the number one defense and it was the idea yeah. that, you know, it was his season and that stuff, um, you know, it's just not probably going to feel like Daniel Hunter's year. To voters, I think I yeah. just don't think he's going to be the defining defensive player. Um, we, I yeah. think we want to also kind of hat tip like Denzel Ward. Like honestly, the fact that the coverage was able to be better for the Browns last year was huge, and yeah. so it does take weird things to make it uh, a guy's year. But that was, I think, really well said. Yep. And Garrett as well, like he won last year with 14 sacks and he got injured and it looked like at one point he was going to be out for the season with his shoulder, I think. Right. And the Browns were dealing with a ton of injuries, I mean, across the whole team, but on, on defense as well as the more publicized injuries on the O-line and at quarterback. So, yeah, I think that certainly at price, I think Garrett is the best bet. Um, before we move off of this, the last thing I'll say is that I think it's very instructive that Kyle Hamilton and Fred Warner got zero buzz whatsoever last year. And Kyle Hamilton um, was the best safety in football on a top two defense. And I think a defense, even though the Browns finished as the number one defense, I think that was the idea by the end of the season, particularly after um, the Ravens completely eviscerated uh, the Niners in the most embarrassing way possible in on the biggest um, in the, under the biggest spotlight possible. Uh, there was no Kyle Hamilton buzz whatsoever. Fred Warner was the best linebacker in football, playing for you know a one seed, no buzz at all. So I just think it's so hard um, unless you have like an, a super outlier season, like the season that um, Deron Bland, uh, if Deron Bland had had like three more pick sixes, then, you know, that's the type of stuff um, that can throw out real outliers like Trayvon Diggs three years ago. If he'd, if he had like seven picks through the first six, seven games or something, if he'd like set the interception record, like there's just incredibly high, high bars to clear um, for non edge rushes, I think. So, um, yeah, it's going to be difficult. Um, for, for someone to emerge um, who is not one of the big edge rushes. So, yeah, to close out, I would back uh, most passionately Garrett at 8 to 1, Parsons plus 550 after that. And then I would have a saver on Aiden Hutchinson to win the sack title at 16 to 1, mm -hmm. uh, which I think okay. is a better bet than his 
uh, Defensive Player of the Year odds, which for the most part are shorter than that. Um, I find it difficult to believe. I mean, it's possible, but I think it's difficult to believe Hutchinson would win DPOY without winning the sack title, given that the Lions' defense might be fine, but I don't think there's really the upside for it to be the number one defense or anything. Absolutely agreed. Okay, fantasy football season just got better. Drew this season, $1 million better. Create or join a private Yahoo Fantasy League and enter the $1 million NBC sweepstakes, plus earn extra entries to win when players on your fantasy roster score a touchdown during an opening weekend game on NBC or Peacock. Download the redesigned Yahoo Fantasy app or go to NBCSports.com slash Fantasy Million to learn more. All right, NFL preseason week two anything on your card at the moment Drew? yeah i played um i played some eagles against the patriots here I'm not exactly sure why the market is so cool on them uh i think ultimately this is a decent opportunity for some of the second unit guys on the eagles to show up a little bit here um and nothing about what the patriots are doing right now suggests that this is a team that can consistently run um good offense i look watch specifically going back to that carolina panthers game and i know the weather was gross i know that there were other extenuating factors but if you're looking like that against the second and third units for carolina then the second and third units for philly might might look even more questionable so uh for me i got philly uh and the uh, in the opener here uh for the week and then uh ended up with a pretty decent stake on the bears as well uh this was an interesting handicap because bears are out to six that's a lot of points to lay in the preseason. No, don't get me wrong. Um, but uh, there's two funny intangibles about this one. Um, number one, Jake Browning is hurt for the uh, the Bengals. So you're now third down the depth chart and less likely to see um, you know, extended uh, service time from Joe Burrow in this one, uh, which means this is going to be a lot of Logan Woodside and a lot of Rocky Lombardi. Um, not that I'm like in love with the Bears defense, but their second and third units should handle those guys relatively comfortably. And uh, a lot of questions right now for me swirling about this Bengals defense on top of the fact that the Bears are really building some momentum here for the fan base. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that they are your hard, hard knocks choice. Um, I don't think that these games are being taken as equally across all teams as a team like the Bears is trying to build momentum with the fan base by putting on a show in the preseason games and then having everybody tune in with baited expectation to see the hard knocks replay of it. And uh, so I think you're going to get a, a, an honest performance out of the Bears here. And I think you're going to see a decent amount of Caleb Williams versus Logan Woodside. Uh, so happy to lay the points there with the Bears. Uh, and that's actually the one that I'm going to need the most to, to make my preseason two work. Okay. Um, staying with rookie quarterbacks, uh, the Broncos are seven point favorites home to the Packers total 39 and a half. Um, how are you feeling about Bo Nix at the moment? Um, do you uh, think that we yeah. McCarthy Oof. after the year that, it, I mean, I didn't think McCarthy was really going to be too much of an O'Roy threat anyway, because I think Donald was going to be the starter, but I mean, with, there was five potential guys who could start um, as rookies, and now it's four, um, if we're including Drake May. Um, mm -hmm. Is Nick's compelling to you in, in that field, uh, and is he compelling to you this week to get a cover against the Packers? Yeah, and I think like uh, the big kind of takeaway from their first preseason game and the reason that the Broncos are so heavily favored is they, they played their guys late into that game, and uh, they were playing four you know they're they're trying to get their young guys as much game experience as they can now because they're going to count on them this year uh, early and often in the season. I think this is uh, you know definitely a youth movement. Um, ironically, they're playing the Packers, who did this last year, <laughs> and I think uh, you know Nick's didn't really he wasn't asked to do much, uh, and in general, I didn't think uh, like he was fine. Um, and uh, you know, but and, and so I think it's possible that Peyton takes tries to take a step forward with what he's calling. It's a little bit more aggressive. It's asking him to do a little bit more. Um, and yeah, if you're up against a second unit Packers team, that's you know, a little bit thin on the defensive side of the ball, then it's probably going to work. So I don't take any exception to them being meaningful favorites. Now for a rookie of the year, I have a really tough time seeing him, you know, Nick's that is meet uh, the statistical output that you're going to get from a 17 game sample of either Caleb Williams or uh, Daniels at this point. And I would have Nick's as less of an injury risk as Daniels. Um, but I would have his ceiling in terms of like just being in the in the conversation for a you know a, an all time record for rookie performance. Uh, Daniels is there, 
he's going to be knocking on the door for the rookie rushing record. He's going to, you know, he could uh, be threatening multiple records. Um, I don't see Nick's kind of in that, in that mold. So um, the fact that Peyton was so conservative with Russell Wilson last year, it's going to take a really special leap for Nick's uh, to kind of get Peyton to kind of take the handcuffs off once we get to real gameplay. So uh, low expectations for, for Nick's and the Broncos in general. And I think the mission is pretty clear that like you develop these young players for, you know, try to make a, a step forward next year. Cause this year it's just, it's the gap between them and the, you know, the top of their division is so enormous. It's hard to me to see exactly what their path to a playoff opportunity looks like. Yeah, it's funny with um, these rookie of the year awards in the NFL, where there is so much variance um, in college translations. That you know, preseason when I'm looking at awards for NBA or um, MLB, I'll be in the weeds um, at a certain level of specificity. But with rookie of the year in the NFL, it's like me texting people in the league, being like, um, "Is Bo Nix any good um, at football?" Because that's kind of the most that's the biggest swing factor, I think. It's just like, is he actually good um, at playing quarterback? And is he going to be good in this Sean Payton offense? I don't really have that much of an idea until we start playing the games and we get to week one. But I think the book on Knicks is that um, he is very high floor, low ceiling, um, which is the type of profile. Uh, and he's got a good offensive play caller. The supporting cast in Denver for him on offense is not good. I don't think it's like it's not as like Bryce Young last year type of bad, but it's not, you know, amazing. So I think that he's probably the type of guy where um he can he can win a race where everyone else falls over. Uh where Caleb gets hurt and Jaden Daniels is actually um you know he's very high variant. So maybe he's just not good. Um and Nick's kind of skates on by. Um but yeah not not super appealing now that the prices are uh, caved a little bit as well. Um, mentioned Bryce Young. The Jets are three and a half point favorites at Carolina. Uh, the Bryce Young buzz is starting to build a little bit. That you know he's a new man under Dave Canales. Uh, again, it's kind of like the Quinton Johnston buzz that is building. It's like we just kind of need to see it uh, in week one of the real season. But any interest or any bets for you in this game? I have been very skeptical of the buzz. Um... I don't know that uh, I'm going to necessarily be betting against the Panthers early and often in the regular season, but I'm certainly going to have to see it first uh, to kind of really come around to this idea that um, there's been enough development there with some of the issues that I still see across that offensive roster that uh, that he's going to take a huge step forward this year. Um, that said, the Jets are giving you nothing. <laughs> they are really, really treading carefully uh, this preseason. From what I can tell you, the the – number of snaps of guys that matter in their first preseason game was effectively nil. I think that's re realistic to expect again. We're certainly not going to see Rodgers in the preseason. And I think just in general, this is a team that, uh, you know, is, is using the preseason to evaluate players 43 through 53. And that's fine. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, Carolina continuing to build some momentum with the win wouldn't shock me at all. Um, but I didn't bet that game. And again, I'm, I'm not, I, there's some big prices early in the season on the look aheads here for this Carolina Panthers team. And like, I know people are going to bet them. They're going to be excited if they win and cover. There's going to be, you know, a big market correction up because there's only one way to go <laughs> correcting these guys and it's up. Uh, but I'm probably going to be on the sidelines. And, um, you know, I, I know you've made a strong case for Canales coach of the year. Those prices are long gone and at current prices, I, I not really interested. So, um, you know, I'm, I would like to see it. I would like to, the South to be competitive. Um, I have huge reservations about what's going on in New Orleans right now. Atlanta, certainly their defense looks atrocious. Uh, huge questions about what Baker Mayfield looks like in the absence of Canales. So, you know, it would be great if there was like a little bit of drama in the NFC South this year. And right now it doesn't look like there will be. So, um, I'm hopeful for it, and I don't want uh, you know Bryce Young to be a lost pick. And uh, oh, by the way, there's some smart people and a big analytics revolution going on in Carolina. So um, in that you know in that context, uh, them kind of taking a step forward in terms of in-game decision making uh, is a reasonable expectation. But um, yeah, I'm going to watch it carefully because I want to see what Bryce Young looks like at game speed. But I'm not going to take too much away from it if they can beat the uh, the B team for the Jets. I'm uh, I'm hugely in on the Panthers, but it's all out of hope and variance <laughs> that the NFL is strange and backing um, big prices on the fact that 
um, you know, they were a two mm. two win team last year, and they had a guy taken uh, at number one who was the consensus number one quarterback in the draft, number one yeah. player in the draft, uh, and now he's a new coach, new surrounding talent, and it's year two, so it's too early to write him off in theory, but that is more hope um, than an actual so, expectation. I got a preseason question for you. So this week, the all the narrative is the joint practices. Right? Yeah. You have, you have actual A team versus A team takeaways, presumably, even though it's practice. Um, do you take any of this as information? And like, I'm specifically looking at the likes of, say, the Seahawks, right? So, um, you know, every report from any room who covers Tennessee was like, ooh, the Seahawks beat us up and down the field, left, right, and center. And the Seahawks were just kind of glowing, like they're having one of the better preseasons of any uh, any team out there in terms of looks like they got the right coach and he's turning things around there. Um, do you, is it fair to take away positives on this in your opinion, or do you basically think that joint practice um, takeaways are overstated? Uh, I think it's difficult to read into. Obviously, like that stuff, I would say that like there's only positive to take out of it from Seattle. So maybe it's nothing, but it could um, bode well for them, whereas it can't really bode poorly, um, which is you know pretty basic thing to say but i think that's the way to look at it i think seattle's are to me maybe the most well there's a lot of interesting teams in the nfl this year but they're one of the three or four that i'm most excited to see in the early part just because i think they are one of the best test cases in recent vintage for just what is the impact of a new head coach and specifically like a new defensive coordinator because sure. the talent the players are mostly the same. The personnel is mostly the same on defense. They've been, you know, they turned over their linebackers. Um, the safety core looks a little bit different. Julian Love is still there, but Quandre Diggs and Jamal Adams are gone. Um, but they're going to play a completely different style of defense and they're going to be coached in a different way. And they go from the oldest coach in the NFL to now the youngest coach in the NFL. And so I think that creates a lot of variance. Like, I don't understand how Seattle's win total is only seven and a half. Um, I would be way over on that. Um, I think that there are, um, yeah, I just think there are lots of upside scenarios with Seattle where I don't think they're going to have like a singular, like absolutely dominant strength. Maybe they get their defense like the edge of the top five and the offense last year was like the 14th ranked offense, I want to say. And maybe that can be a fringe top 10 unit. And then all of a sudden you're, a, you know, potentially a, a 12 win team. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think that with the preseason joint scrimmage stuff, I don't really know what to read into that. But I mean, it's just another sign um, that bodes well for the Seahawks. Yeah. Okay. That's a fair way to put it. Uh, Cause like I had my finger hovering on Seahawks versus as pick em versus the Titans. And usually when you get this lopsided coverage of joint practice, like sometimes the team that's winning practice, winning practice gets to the game and it's like, well, mission accomplished. <laughs> like we've already done our job this week. Uh, so, you know, we're really going to take this game off. And so I, I, I didn't end up betting the Seahawks against the Titans despite all of the buzz. Uh, about how good they look in those practices and honestly like I, i'm fully drinking the seahawks kool-aid because um there are very few innovators at the nfl level there's a lot of copycats um what mcdonald did last year looked like true innovation and excited to see what he does with this unit that has some really good young talent um you know that been staring at the <laughs> Byron murphy dp D -O D Roy price um don't think it can make a case for witherspoon DPOY, um, but uh, certainly there are some bright spots on this defense with uh, some some innovative vision that I'm excited to see play out. Yeah, I think that the Seahawks, they and one of the reasons I think they're so compelling is that they were like the 28th ranked defense last year. Um, yeah. And they're you, like, you look at, they have a lot of talent and maybe it doesn't stand out because they're not huge names, but like, and I guess the, the only real name brand guy on the defense is Witherspoon, who, you know, everyone adores. I guess Tariq Woolen kind of because he had a really good rookie season, but then he fell off a bit last year. But, I mean, yeah, Byron Murphy in the preseason against the Chargers, understanding he was going up against second and third stringers, he looked like an absolute monster. <laughs> um, and if he fortifies that interior defensive line, they don't have any marquee edge rushes but they have a rotation of guys yeah. um who can i think be somewhat useful like they got um and wosu last year was injured and he should give them more this season um and then you just hope that with mcdonald's system which is 
uh, built so much on deception and yeah. simulation that they can just conjure up an edge rush um, and pressures the way that I think Baltimore led the league in pressures last year, despite their best edge rusher being like old Jadeveon Clowney, basically. <laughs> um, Matt Bouquet was all right. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm thinking of him more as an interior guy. Okay, um, okay. That maybe Byron Murphy Edge rusher, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that that would be the hope. He doesn't have the talent that he had in Baltimore. But I mean, two years ago, people weren't looking at Baltimore as like a you know top one, top two talented no. defense. And that's uh, that's where they ended up um, in the end. All right. Uh, before we move off the NFL, um, last game to get to. The Raiders are six and a half point favorites over the Cowboys. The total is 39 and a half. It is very, it feels poetically right that an Antonio Pierce coach team uh, is six and a half point favorites in a preseason game. Feels like he was born um, for this. Uh, it seems like the QB decision will come uh, early next week, perhaps. O'Connell and Minshew are both expected to play a quarter. Mm-hmm. I believe in the market, they're around pick. And it's not that it's a liquid market, but it, they're around pick to be the starter. Mm-hmm. Um, any interest in anything in this game? And do you have a sense of who ultimately is the starter? Yeah, Minshew. Okay. I would say much more than pick. Uh, he okay. probably I would put him at like 66, 33. Um, it's going to take a pretty impressive performance by O'Connell in this game uh, to change my opinion there. And I think just in general, like the Raiders don't look like a team that really understands where they are. <laughs> in the context of a rebuild uh and they're going to try to win and you know Minshew gives them a better chance so uh i think they're going to go in that direction it's going to be chaotic it's going to be weird they're going to have some wild games uh Minshew's going to make some mistakes but he ultimately him kind of holding the fort to the tune of if the defense can keep their opponents in the 13 point range then the raiders have a chance that's that's kind of the uh that's the mission this this year and they may ultimately get to around a 500 team uh, particularly because I think they have some decent advantages over the Broncos and the Chargers as currently rostered. So, um, yeah, you could be looking at a second running um, Raiders team here uh, with eight or nine wins, and I don't think we should be shocked. That said, um, yeah, I don't think they're going to the playoffs, and if they do make the playoffs, I think they're probably going to be like, what, 10-point dogs in a 2-7 matchup or something like that. So it's not going to go great. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I have, uh, I have Minshew tabbed as the guy. Okay. Well, it looks like he's a slight dog. It's basically pick in the market. And on a fresh account, you could bet Minshew to win 750 bucks. So mm-hmm. at minus 102. So maybe worth uh, worth a flyer. I don't have a read there, but I will uh, I will defer to you, <laughs> Drew Dinsick. All right. The Rotoworld Draft Guide is here for you during the peak of draft season. And this year, it has added features available exclusively through a new partnership with Matthew Berry's Fantasy Life. Get a Fantasy Life Plus subscription and receive the Rotoworld Draft Guide to help you crush your competition. Use promo code ROTO10 for 10% off and unlock extensive fantasy, DFS, and betting tools now. Go to NBCSports.com slash Fantasy Life to learn more. All right, before we get out of here, the English Premier League kicks off this weekend, Drew. Manchester City, um, as is their nature, are plus 140 favorites to win for what feels like the 10th year in a row, even though Liverpool broke up um, the reign of terror uh, for one year at least. (laughs) Arsenal are plus 160, Liverpool plus 650, and then you drop down further to Chelsea 16 to 1, Tottenham 25 to 1, and then Man United. uh, Same price in Newcastle, 28 to 1. Um, Any overarching thing that you're looking for in the Premier League season? Any speculative bet that you've had for now? Uh, yeah, I'm a Liverpool man this year. Okay. Um, at price, this is, I think the gap's just not as big uh, and getting a little bit of a bounce this year wouldn't be shocking. And I think there are two kind of key things that I'm watching for in the Premier League this year. Um, down the stretch last year, I felt like Man City was, uh, the slippage was real. Like, I don't think it was it was covered as such because ultimately, like, they still ended up winning the uh, the Premier League. And, you know, they were heavy favorites to win the Champions League, but it was not as dynamic, even close, as the way they finished the prior season. And I didn't really look at any of their moves and think game changer. Um, So ultimately, I think Man City continuing to kind of come back to the pack uh, at the top of the EPL looks realistic to me. Um, And then the other, so so kind of keeping an eye on Man City continuing to regress is one of my my, uh, uh, angles. And then the other one is just... This is starting to look very La Liga <laughs> and all of a sudden. Like the second and third class of the EPL didn't used to be huge steps down. 
And now it kind of feels like they are. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what's going on with the dynamics of team composition now, but uh, it certainly feels like there's really only three teams that could win. Um, and, you know, considering the fact that one of those teams is priced around seven to one, then I'm a Liverpool man. <laughs> I think Liverpool, uh, there's a lot of angst over Jurgen Klopp leaving, but at the same time, I think that had somewhat run its course. Um, and they didn't, like, they overperformed um, their underlying metrics last year. I don't think they were quite as close um, to the top two as uh, their points total ultimately implied. And you can look at that two ways. One means that they've got um, a larger hill to climb, but then you could also look at it like, well, why are we so upset about losing a manager who seemingly didn't put us in an amazing position despite having um, an excellent squad? I think the most compelling betting aspect of this season, I think the, the storyline that will ultimately define the season is if you're just scrolling through all the different futures markets in the Premier League, um, the thing that jumps out the most is that Man City are plus 140 to win the title and Man City are 10 to 1 to get relegated. Uh, and that is because there is this um, investigation that is hanging over yeah. Man City and there is the expectation that it is going to be resolved uh, within this season. And there is a, uh, I would think, pretty um, significant chance or at least a material chance that they face something from a points deduction to out outright relegation. Uh, and there is precedent for that in the Premier League. And I think that is being somewhat baked in to the market now. I think if that wasn't hanging over City, that they wouldn't perhaps be as long as plus 140. Um, but that is the thing. Like if you're super bullish on Man City to win the title, um, just know that the rug may get pulled out from you at any moment. And mm -hmm. if they have like a seven-point lead um, at some point, well, that might now be an 11-point deficit or something, just, <laughs> just like that. So you have to be careful. Like there were... Points deductions handed down last season. Um, Everton uh, were uh, one of the more high-profile victims, I guess, of that. I don't know if victim is the right word, but that's that's the punishment that they copped. So for that, um, Arsenal are compelling to me um, at price. That would probably be my bet. Okay. Um, I think that they've fortified their squad by adding uh, Calafiore, uh, during mm -hmm. Timber comes back from injury. That was kind of the only weakness of the team, um, I think. And so uh, I just worry a little bit about one Man City's depth. Like they don't, they lost to Julian Alvarez. Um, and I don't think they've really replaced him. Um, if Haaland goes down for any period at all, they're in trouble. Yeah. I agree uh, with what you said about the fact that they didn't. They kept on winning down the stretch, but they weren't doing it in particularly impressive fashion. Um, someone who lost a lot of money on Man City in the Champions League mm -hmm. was deeply unimpressed by how they performed against Real Madrid um, in a game that you know Madrid were basically just sitting back and Man City couldn't do anything. I think it's been a little bit um, not covered that much. How much Kevin De Bruyne I think has fallen off. He's just like three years, two two years ago even. I think he was like the third best player in the world or something. And he just, everything is just a beat off. Like the cadences are just a little bit off and he's constantly hurt, which is another issue. Um, and so I think that between the depth, between the fact that this is like year one million of Pep, um, who I think grinds on some people. <laughs> and the, the biggest thing of all is just this potential points deduction that could be coming. Um, couldn't get involved with City at price. So Arsenal would be my lean. If I was going to back any long shot and, you know, this is outside of Leicester, Obviously, this isn't typically the league um, for long shots, but Chelsea Drew have a squad that is valued by transfer market at 1.14 billion euros, um, which is right next to Arsenal, ahead of Liverpool, Man United. It's the third highest valuation. Now, it's also because they have 44 guys in their squad. If you look at the yeah. average um, per player, it gets a little bit lower. But this team has a ton of talent um, and it's just they have too much talent is the issue. And it's not the pieces don't fit amazingly well, but they have a new coach um, and they should have better health than they did last year. And I don't really think that they are going to knock off Arsenal, um, who are just a bit more of a well-oiled machine and I think more, more talented and more cohesive. But in worlds where you're talking about tail outcomes with City, um, and maybe it's not even a tail outcome that City gets a points deduction, um, but 
in a more wide open race. I think that there are worlds where Chelsea, if you can find them mm. in the 20 to one range, that would be my long shot bet. Okay. Uh, what do you make of how young they are? Uh, well, youth <laughs> creates upside in theory. Okay. Um, the okay. funny thing is, is that, and this is kind of the ongoing joke with Chelsea, but so they have 44 players in their squad. Um, yeah, squad valuation of over a billion dollars. And then you look at like the starting 11 and it's like, I think they need some upgrades. <laughs> I think they need some <laughs> new players. Um, so now I think a lot of that was just last year. Uh, they're like at striker. They were just all over the place. They're playing Nico Jackson. It's like the mm. lead guy and he just wasn't um, as like a 22 year old and he just wasn't ready for that. And now with better health from Nkunku, um, I think that'll help a lot. Um, I'm a believer in the talent of uh, Mikhailo Mudrik, um, even though he gets painted as a bit of a dribble merchant um, and perhaps not the best team player. I just think that the talent is immense and that he should be better as well. Um, year two of the Caicedo uh, Enzo partnership, I think that should just go better. I think those guys are just, again, too talented to fail in the same way that they did last year. Um, so look, they've got weaknesses. Um, the defense and goalkeeper situation doesn't fill you with a ton of confidence, but mm -hmm. I just think that they're the good thing too is that um, they can just try a lot of different things. Like they have so many players, like just keep, <laughs> keep trying different stuff until you find the right combinations. Um, and Cole Palmer, who is probably the biggest emergence um, of any single player last year in the Premier League becoming sure. the, like a genuine superstar and i don't know why they didn't play him um more in the euros um but anyway uh, i think that chelsea they have a lot of upside through that youth and just through having a ton of different players and the new coach so um yeah i think the long shots are the most compelling yeah cole palmer is interesting he's one of those guys who's like clearly their most valuable player or in the conversation and he's 22 <laughs> and so it's like man like can he sustain a full season uh, if he had, you know, carries the break out through to this year, and I agree with you, you know, he didn't play. I think we can only look at Southgate as far as why we didn't see more of him in Europe, but whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, this is it's a very very tough team to handicap, and I guess you're, you know, ultimately if the po point is you're expecting Man City something to happen, and you're trying to capitalize on that with price, then picking a team that's going to get that third or fourth um you know mid-season and maybe make the make a run down the stretch is really where you want to be so prices uh definitely pointing at chelsea for me it's liverpool but i could you don't have to twist my arm very hard uh to buy into this chelsea team yep uh and also the market loved chelsea last year for whatever you want to read into that now the market was wrong uh, and they kept on not living <laughs> up to expectations but for whatever it's worth the market you'd always look at be like how are chelsea favored in this game or, or in this match um but uh, they came good towards the end of the season, and I think there is upside there, um, but uh, it likely goes wrong for them because it tends to go wrong for them lately, but I do think there is some variance in that team. All right, we are done for today. Don't forget to check out NBCSports.com for more information to help you with your wages. Thanks to those of you watching on the NBC Sports YouTube channel, and if you're listening to us in podcast form, don't forget to rate and subscribe. Also a reminder to find all your favorite NBC Sports shows on Amazon Music. Just head to amazon.com slash NBC Sports. From Jay Croucher and Drew Dinsick, we'll see you soon.